What's going on YouTube? It's Teach back again with another video and today we are going over my very first three round 2024 NFL mock draft and of course there are going to be trades in this video. We're actually going to start this video with a handful of trades. Before we get started we got a lot of picks to go through but there's a couple of things I had just kind of have to point out and just kind of give you some context for how I'm moving forward in this mock draft. Um, on my previous mocks I've had Kirk Cousins to Atlanta kind of in my mind and because of that I haven't had Atlanta take a quarterback. Um, sometimes I've mentioned that, sometimes I haven't. Apologies for that. Today I wanted to do something a little different. Let's let's play with the idea that he that he stays in Minnesota for a year or two. Uh, he resigns with the Vikings, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and knock out some of the other moves as we'll enter this draft. And of course, we're going to start with the uh, Justin Fields trade. Let me move myself to this corner. We're going to have Fields. We're going to have him going back to Pittsburgh. Um, you know, and especially when you see like betting favorites for Russell Wilson, the Steelers are like number one there. You know, please God, no, do not give me Russell Wilson. I will take Justin Fields uh, any day of the week compared to uh, the Russell Wilson, Wilson uh, situation. And because of that, I'm trying to think, you know, where can Kenny Pickett go? Today I just decided Raiders. It doesn't give you like the best QB room, right? Like Aiden O'Connell and Kenny Pickett dueling it out. But that being said, it gives him one other guy. It gives him a you know kind of a, a dart to throw at the board, and who knows? Now he has Devontae Adams. Maybe that you know is kind of the, the missing piece. Maybe it's just like a new offense. It does feel like I'm punishing Kenny Pickett here, having to go from Matt Canada for multiple years to Luke Getzey. So apologies, uh, Kenny Pickett. Um, and I thought about going ahead and doing a Mac Jones trade. Let me know if you'd want that in the next mock. I would probably just have him going to Denver or Atlanta. I have both those teams taking quarterback in this mock. A little bit of a spoiler there, but. Um, because we're not getting to the fifth round, I, I just figured it didn't really matter. But Mac Jones, the Broncos to Atlanta as a backup slash cheap, you know, com competition option. Or, or if like the offseason doesn't go your way, you're not like having to start Desmond Ritter all over again or whatever. Um, or you're not having to start Jared Stidham. It, it could be an option. So let me know if you want to see a Mac Jones trade in the next mock. But we got 101 picks to go through. So let's go ahead and start. Caleb Williams is going to go number one overall. You know, I'm kind of, I think I'll flip back. Um, I've always been a tools traits guy, so I think Caleb Blaine's right now my 1A, but I love him and Drake May a ton, so it, it it's it's just going to come down to you want the higher floor, do you want the special stuff that Caleb brings, um, and I mean, I, you know, I've got, and part of the reason I think I switched him back to 1A was like, I've kind of been viewing that Lincoln Riley offense as a negative, and, and there's some ways where it's like, yeah, that offense isn't totally going to translate to the NFL level, but I didn't really hold that against Kyler, I didn't hold it against Jalen Hurts, I didn't hold it against Baker, um, and ultimately those guys have all been you know, ranging levels of fine, you know, a one guy playing in the Super Bowl not too long ago, one guy a few years ago, MVP front runner, and the other one's coming off the best year of his career. So, you know, I think they all belong in the NFL, so I don't really want to hold that offense against Caleb Williams. Did have a lot more playmakers than I think Drake May, Drake May had, and that is, I think, part of the reason I like Drake May uh, a lot, and I think if you switch those, you know, situations, like, I think there's a lot of people who would have Drake May at QB1, uh, but I love them both a ton. QB1A, QB1B, can't go wrong either way. Chicago needs to reset the position. You got a second rounder from Pittsburgh for Justin Fields. I, I think that's that's a pretty awesome way to kind of continue to build up this roster while still getting that franchise guy. And for Washington, like I don't think there's any problem with UNC quarterback backing up a USC starter. Like the Tar Heels have just gotten better and better at the position. I think Howell was better than Trubisky. I think May is easily the best of the three of them. So um, I, don't worry about the helmet. Worry about the player. May does so much right, and he's one of the younger guys in this class. And there's things you need to touch up, but because he's on the younger side, you feel confident that he's going to get there. And I, I see a ton of Justin Herbert. So uh, really like Drake May a ton. Really like Caleb Williams a ton. These two teams need to reset that position. You know, you, you've heard these picks a ton. And then I am going to go Jane Daniels here at three. I just, you know, I have five of the six quarterbacks that I think can go round one or ultimately, you know, honestly, if we get six QBs round one, it wouldn't shock me. I'm going to have one guy fall to the second round and that one guy I don't really think is a New England fit or, or an Alex Van Pelt as the OC type of fit. So we'll let Penix go elsewhere in the second round. Um, and then this is your opportunity to strike while the iron's hot. And this team has a lot of cap space. So yeah, you could go Marvin Harrison Jr. like we did in my last mock, but um I think if you go Jaden here, you can still spend in free agency at receiver, sign one, and then we're going to draft one in the third round uh, in today's video. So I think there's you can find more ways to kind of build out around Pop Douglas uh, and that receiving core. Uh, and then we're going to have a trade here. This is much more of a trade that like sounds cool, is fun to think about, uh, than I would say it's maybe practical, just because the Chargers still have a lot of holes in this roster. And look, they're in salary cap hell, or is one of the teams closest to it. So like... 
these picks, you know, if you can add these cheap players to the roster, they should definitely consider doing that. But we're going to have basically a uh, pick swap at 69 and 90, which is nice here. I got to move the, the screen over. Apologies, guys, that you can't see that. But uh, five for four, and then Cardinals are going to get 21 better spots uh, and the third round. And then the Chargers are going to give up pick 106, so just outside the top 100 type of stuff. So um, that's the trade. Again, kind of more fun to think about than I would say it is practical for the Chargers. But what makes this kind of a fun idea as we force this trade through is then the idea that Justin Herbert gets Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Like giving Justin Herbert Marv is very much akin to giving Burrow Jamar Chase, right? Uh, except these two guys didn't play together in college or anything. But also, like, the only reason Ohio State was even in the game this year with Michigan was because of Maserati Marv. So, like, if there's a guy who's going to look at him and say, that dude's all world, like... Harbaugh is kind of the dude. Uh, so it, it'd just be a really cool way to kind of be like, this is, you know, the clear cut number one generational prospect. Um, we're going to partner up with Justin Herbert, giving him a guy that he's going to be, you know, throwing the ball to for the next 10 years. And we're going to build our offense around these two guys. Um, ultimately, my next mock, if you're a Chargers fan and you hate this, don't worry, my next mock's going to be very different. Uh, so uh, I think it's going to be much more akin to what Harbaugh traditionally has done. So this is, again, more fun to think about than I would say it's practical. The next mock's going to be a little different. And then the advantage here for the Cardinals is, hey, we go from 90 to up to 69, get another pick just outside the top 100 so basically called another top 100 pick and if you were to ask me you know AJ Green was a little before I started to get into the NFL draft and started scouting pretty heavily and um Julio Jones same thing so if you were to ask me top three receiver prospects I've ever watched I'd probably go Maserati Marv Jamar Chase Malik Neighbors legitimately I think every year other than this one and then the Chase year Neighbors would be my wide receiver one and you could convince me maybe flip Marv and, and Jamar Chase like I don't know Chase at 19 was just bananas in 2019 um but that being said, like the Cardinals could look at it. We get all these assets and we take one half step tier below, you know, Marv to get Malik Neighbors, who honestly, you know, I think it'd be just fine with Michael Wilson and Maserati Marv. But Neighbors is the big, big play explosive guy. And then Michael Wilson is the underneath kind of old school possession. Rondell Moore is your kind of gadget guy. Maybe add one more guy in the mix there in the free agency pool, a little bit of do everything type, kind of like a Kendrick Bourne. You can get him for cheap, does a little bit of everything. All of a sudden, that looks like a great receiving core around. Kyler Murray. So I don't know. For the Cardinals, this feels like a win. You get a ton of picks and you still get a generational receiver prospect. Anyways, on to the uh, New York Giants. We're going to go Roma Dunze here. He's that big physical wide receiver. They just, you know, this is what Kenny Galladay, Kenny Galladay was supposed to be, right? Like the guy that can win those 50 50 balls, stretch the field, win those back shoulder throws, sharp rat runner, can be a little bit of a yards after the catch weapon, which I think is a little bit of an added plus. But big physical guy, rat runner that can win at all three levels, can be the focal point of an offense. This is this is what the Giants need. Alt to the Tennessee Titans, then at seven. I think we, you know, we've done this a thousand times, and Alt's been my OT1 this entire cycle. Um, and I still, th I still think, you know, Brian Callahan, yeah, he comes from Cincy. They drafted Joe Burrow over uh, Penestool. This is going to be a team that, you know, is going to prioritize offensive line just as much as they're going to prioritize receiver. And again, Kind of like New England, I think you can get receiver on day two and sign a guy in free agency. So I think like an ideal situation is once we get to the second round, we're going to go receiver there and then sign like a Tyler Boyd. And then you have receiver we take in the second round, Traylon Burks, and then Tyler Boyd. All of a sudden, that's like not a bad trio to have around Will Levis. Partnering up Joe Alton with Peter Skronsky gives you a great left side of the offensive line to build that offense through. Then we get to the Atlanta Falcons. And Falcons fans, I know you're going to hate this and I'm sorry, but the pick's going to be J.J. McCarthy. Look, McCarthy is a Shanahan, McVay type of quarterback, specifically McVay. Like, and I, and I look at Zach Robinson coming from the Rams, Raheem Morris even more, now the head coach in Atlanta, but really focusing on Robinson as the OC. Coming from L.A., coming from working under McVay, like I could totally see where he sees J.J. McCarthy as like his chance to draft and develop someone into what McVay had with Matt Stafford. And then the same thing's true about Minnesota at 11. Like, I really do think these two teams make a lot of sense. And... Where most people are like, eh, J.J. McCarthy, I'm good, I don't want it, and myself included. I would let someone else draft him in the first round, for sure, personally. I think those two teams are going to see the tools, the traits, the upside, and think, hey, he's 21 years old, we can develop this guy into our own version of Stafford. And it's going to be a little bit of an offensive-heavy uh, Atlanta mock draft, at least to start, which is kind of fun to think about. Because, like, you get the quarterback right, you add one more receiver, this could easily be the most talented roster in the NFC South, if not like pretty clearly the most talented roster in the NFC South. So again, I know Falcons fans are going to hate it. Russell Wilson, J.J. McCarthy, the two uniting forces for most fan bases. Nobody wants to touch them with a 10-foot pole. But I think, you know, with these McVay guys picking in the top 11, Robinson, you know, under Raheem Morris and then uh, Kevin O'Connell and stuff, I think they're going to like McCarthy a good bit. Anyways, let's move on to the Chicago Bears. I decided I'm going to go Jared Verse. To me, it makes a little bit more sense that Dallas Turner or Byron Murphy would be the first defensive player off the board. But I think Verse is a better fit. That kind of heavy-handed 4-3 defensive end. Um, 
plays with a little bit more power. And while Dallas Turner's bulking up, Verse, I think, is already there to kind of fit this, you know, again, 4-3 kind of base. Pair him up with Montez Sweat, two high-level run defenders, while also, like, with their second rounder basically being Montez Sweat and your first rounder here at nine being Jared Verse, all of a sudden, that edge group looks great. You have a couple of uh, mid-round picks from last year. Gervon Dexter, who flashed towards the end of the season, and Zach Pickens from South Carolina. All of a sudden, the defensive line looks pretty solid. And I think you can add one more defensive interior for relatively cheap and free agency, and I'm feeling great about that D-line in Chicago. To the Jets, no shocker here. I've done this a thousand times. Olu Fashanu, best pass-protecting tackle in this class. Uh, I know he's starting to dip down people's boards. I don't get it. Uh, I know he needs to add strength. He struggles against power rushers, and he's not great in the run game. But the Jets, look, look. They have Aaron Rodgers, who just popped his Achilles. Like, they, they want the best pass protecting left tackle in this class. And I could see a world where, you know, if they bring in his buddy David Boxiari, which, hey, if you ask me, that's like 90%. I, I feel pretty pretty positive that that's going to end up happening. Maybe Olu could flip to the right side. I don't know. Uh, that could be kind of an interesting combination. And if Olu lives up to who he is as a prospect and they sign Bakhtiari, that could easily be, if all stays healthy, one of the best pass protecting duos at offensive tackle. Or they could go Fashanu and then we'll figure out the right tackle spot. Maybe ABT, maybe you sign a guard, who knows. But I think until then, I'm going to go Olu Fashanu. But don't be surprised, I could see the Jets, instead of relying on a rookie to step in and start a tackle, just handling this business at free agency. Bringing in Bakhtiari, re-signing Becton, or you know, whatever. And then going Brock Bowers here, which uh, that's going to be something I continue to kind of flip-flop in these mock drafts. Olu and then Brock Bowers at 10. But don't be surprised if they go veteran tackle option instead of hoping that a rookie hits the ground running and then draft Bowers here at 10. To the Minnesota Vikings at 11. Uh, you know, Byron Murphy, I think, is going to go somewhere in the top 13. Like, I really don't see him get past the Raiders. And, you know, I haven't mocked the Vikings, but it's it's a pick that makes a lot of sense, guys. Like, this defensive interior is atrocious. God-awful. You got to think Brian Flores, right, when he gets to Miami, they get Christian Wilkins. Like, this is a type of... I'm not saying he's going to be Christian Wilkins. I... You know, maybe I think he has superstar potential for sure, but I'm not going to comp him to Christian Wilkins. I don't want that to get carried away. But like that type of impact totally could be there. Um, yeah, no, I, I know Edge is going to be a, a big problem spot. We're going to come back to that once we get to the second round uh, because they could lose Hunter, they could lose Wanham, they could lose uh, Davenport. Totally hear you there, but right now they're 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 starting with nothing on the defensive interior. Byron Murphy or Jared, uh, excuse me, uh, Dallas Turner. To me, when it comes to upside, they make the most sense to be the first defensive player off the board. Just didn't shake out here, but I love the idea of Murphy being the second one off the board. I think it's a really underrated need and a, a position that they, uh, the Vikings could attack if McCarthy is off the board. Here at 12, Denver Broncos, Bo Nix. You've heard me talk about this a thousand times before. His underneath processing, his underneath accuracy, plus NFL caliber arm strength. Not like the biggest arm, but enough to push the ball deep down the field and take those shot chances. You kind of saw Sean, uh, Sean Payton doing that last year, working underneath, and then they time up those chances. I think Bo Nix is the exact guy to do that while giving you the mobility and a little bit more of a build closer to to a Taysom Hill than what, you know, Russell Wilson is. And obviously Drew Brees had next to no mobility. Uh, so this is kind of the blending of the worlds that I think Sean Payton has been wanting since he was kind of towards the end of his tenure in New Orleans. So I think Bo Nix, J.J. McCarthy, those two guys make a ton of sense for the Broncos. In this situation, J.J. is off the board. So Bo Nix becomes the pick. At 13, I've done this too. Uh, Raiders take Talise Fuwaga, plug and play him at right tackle. It's a position I need. Jermaine Illuminor hitting free agency. Love that Mahler uh, uh, play style that uh, Fuwaga plays with specifically in the run game. But I also think he's a better pass protector than I think a lot of people wanted to give him credit for. I think the senior bowl kind of reassured me there. So feel really comfortable with Talise Fuwaga as OT3 in this class. Plug and play option. And we'll come back to it in the second round. It's a little lazy to say this, but that type of physicality and that type of like, I'm going to kill the dude across from me. I don't know. Something about that just kind of screams. That should be a Raider. Let's get to the Saints then at 14. Actually, this is going to end up being a trade. And this is one that I've done a handful of times. One, the Saints, they're starting to get their way to getting themselves out of salary cap hell. But accumulating more picks would go a long way. And they're going to ultimately get pick 80 from Cincinnati, which we will get to in this mock. Um, and just trying to get a few more cheaper options on the roster. And then for Cincinnati, assuming, you know, T Tyler Boyd is gone. They did tag T. Higgins. I think that, you know, works for the season. Brock Bowers becomes that, you know, power slot. He could be an upgraded tight end. He also just could be your slot receiver. A lot of different ways you can move him around on the field. But at least you have a trio still moving forward with Chase, Higgins, and Bowers, at least for this year. And then you can spend another year kind of developing Andre Yoshivas. Maybe he's a T. Higgins replacement. Maybe you're playing Bowers in line. Charlie Jones is going to be your guy from the slot, and that's going to be your future trio. Think it just gives you at least another year to kind of piece it together. And Bowers plus Chase plus Burrow, that's that's an awesome like kind of headline to the offense in general for Cincinnati. And for pick 80, they, got, they could use that pick for sure to patch up some spots on the roster, but it's a relatively healthy roster. Adding a Brock Bowers 
th- that's a huge that's a huge addition to that offense. All right, let's get to the uh, Indianapolis Colts. This one makes a ton of sense. You've seen it in a thousand mocks before. Quinion Mitchell, his experience in zone coverage, his movement skills. Underrated physical guy. Could play inside and out, too, depending on what happens with Kenny Moore here. That could be kind of a fun idea. But if Gus Bradley, assuming he's back as DC, like, I think you play him on the outside. You pair him up with Juju. Actually, you know what? Here's here's a little theory, and I don't want to get too, too carried away here because we've got a lot of picks still to go over. Hear me out if you're a Colts fan. Let's say Kenny Moore decides to go elsewhere. Could could you see a world where Quinion Mitchell plays on the outside and Jalen Jones is the other outside corner, who, by the way, I thought should have gone way before the seventh round. I didn't love him out of Texas A&M, but, like, thought of him as like a third, fourth round guy, kind of end of the third, early fourth. And I thought like, get this guy into a cover three defense. He's the perfect build for that corner. And he's in one. So could Jalen Jones be that, you know, underrated outside corner two, Quinion Mitchell, first round investment. He becomes your outside corner one. And then Juju Brents at six foot four with a six, six, three, three cone that change of direction skills and that size and that arm length. That guy could be an alien cover the middle of the field and taking away slot receivers. Like, I don't know if they lose on Kenny Moore, like I think Juju Brents in the slot could be insane. It could just be a more athletic Jeremy Chin, right? Like a guy with insane change of direction skills, but that same type of build and experience playing on the outside dating back to college. Like, I don't know. Let me know if you're a Colts fan. I think it's a really fun one here, but Quinion Mitchell, like I said, you've seen it a thousand times in mocks because it makes a ton of sense and 15 feels about the right spot for his value. Seattle, Jackson Powers Johnson. Uh, you probably give Olu- Oluwatimi the chance to start at center and then have Jackson Powers Johnson replace one of the two guards that's being a free agent this year. He looked great playing guard at the Senior Bowl. I have no concerns with that. And if Oluwatimi doesn't work out, you just slide JPJ back over to center and then you patch up the interior, which I also think this team could probably add two cheap you know, um, veterans you know, uh, in free agency just to give you that floor that you know like they're not going to be the worst starting options. Like uh, like if a John Feliciano doesn't go back to San Francisco, not the sexiest name, but like if you have to move JPJ back to center, you can you can feel okay that that guy's not going to lose your games there at one of the guard spots. So something like that could totally be the plan here in Seattle. JPJ position flexibility gives Seattle a lot of options, and it's just a clear clear position of need. I think 16, I, I think that's the right spot for him to go, if I'm honest, even though he is a center slash guard. All right, to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Another pick that I, I just... I, the longer I think about it, the more I think Calvin Ridley's probably not going to be back. So Brian Thomas Jr. makes all the sense in the world. Field stretching, vertical guy. Not a whole lot of in-breaking or outbreaking routes under his tape, but you got Christian Kirk for that. You got to have a name room to kind of do the underneath stuff. Hitch, come back, and go balls. This guy's going to bring that explosiveness, and hopefully his ball tracking ability does carry on to the next level because we saw way too many almost touchdowns between Trevor Lawrence and Calvin Ridley. Those need to become six. Those need to become those chunk plays, even if it's not in the end zone. And I, I feel pretty good about Brian Thomas Jr. and that ball tracking skills, the high point ability, all that carrying over to the NFL level and turning those 50-50 almost plays into 50-50 big plays for Jacksonville. To the New Orleans Saints at 18. I'm going to go J.C. Latham here. Um, I think, I think there's a world where Latham could probably flip over to play left tackle. Um, but we're kind of figuring out what's going to end up happening with Ryan Ramchak. I could also see a world where Latham plays guard for a season, pending another chance to, to stand out at left tackle if Ryan, Ch- Ryan Ramchak is back at right tackle. If not, Latham plug and play, you play him at right tackle. Simple as that. So um, a lot of different ways this could ultimately play, uh, play out, but some people think Latham could be a great guard. So if Ramchak's back, you have that. If he's not back, you have his replacement here. And plus, you got pick 80 while still addressing a position of need. True win-win there in the first round for New Orleans. It's a very backwards way of how they normally operate first round business. All right, then we get to the uh, Los Angeles Rams, and this is just like one of the biggest steals uh, of the draft. Again, I think Dallas Turner easily could be the first defensive player off the board. And if there's only going to be one defensive player in the top 10, again, I think him, Byron Murphy, the uh, second, make the most sense, or Byron Murphy Jr. Um, is it Jr. or the second? Now I'm now I'm doubting myself. It's the, it's the second. I shouldn't have doubted myself. Um, but Dallas Turner to L.A., super explosive athlete. Pair him up with Byron Young. I think Dallas Turner is a more polished pass rusher. Uh, and then you have Aaron Donald, the center of that defense. Like, Dallas Turner is going to get one-on-ones, and he's going to either win with the improved inside counter, the strength that he's added, or just going back to over-reliable. Dip and tuck underneath these offensive tackles. Win, attack that outside shoulder. I, I mean, he's going to get one-on-ones, and he's just he's too good of a player to be left in those spots. But that's what happens when you have Aaron Donald on that defense. So this would be an absolute steal for the L.A. Rams. Next up is the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm going to go Terry and Arnold. Inside out flexibility. So depending on what happens, like can they sign a Legereus Sneed? Can they get a Jalen Johnson? Um, do they bring back a Mike Hilton? You know, if they do that, Hilton plays in, inside, Arnold plays outside. So um, consider we don't know what's going to happen in free agency. 
Arnold here feels like a safe pick for Pittsburgh because no matter what ends up shaking out in free agency, this guy's a plug-and-play starter inside or out. And just great tape. Redshirt sophomore, so one of the younger guys in this class. Insane change of direction skills uh, and plays a little bit bigger than what he's actually listed at. But another guy that's going to tear up the combine too. Definitely going to go somewhere here in the first round and ultimately probably somewhere in the top 20, especially after the year he just had at Bama. All right, so after back-to-back -back uh, Crimson Tide players come off the board, now we're going to go to the ACC and have Duke's Graham Barton come off the board. It's the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, and especially now they cut Zayvon Howard. They could go corner here, but I think offensive line's the move, and I think in my next mock, I'm probably going to go ahead and draft tackle and then go into offensive line. Like, I think, honestly, Miami should really consider doubling down on this position one way or another, depending, no matter what they do. If they go Barton here in the first round, flexible into your offensive lineman, should probably double dip there because they could lose their center, they could be losing their right guard, and their left tackle might retire. So, like, you know, a lot of holes to patch up on that offensive line, and we saw what happens when they get to the second and third options of those guys on the inter offensive line. It, it kind of made a little bit of a more bumpy offense towards the middle uh, end of the season. Those couple games where we had to watch a Lester Cotton and a Liam Eichenberg play left guard and center, respectively. Don't want to see any more of that, so Grant Barton here at 21 makes a ton of sense, and I, would, I wouldn't shy away from doubling down this position, so we'll do that in my next mock. Then we get to the Philadelphia Eagles at 22. I'm going to go Cooper DeGene here, a little something different than what I've normally done. I know Howie Roseman doesn't normally go first-round corner. I know a lot of Eagles fans don't see it as a need. But, man, I, I think Cooper DeGene's the best slot player in this class, you know, with Terry Arnold right behind him. Um, and, look, Avante Maddox has always had injury issues. Like, could you add Cooper DeGene as one run game reinforcements with his ability and willingness to tackle that close to the center of the defense and playing at the line of scrimmage? Yes, I think that the answer to that is yes. Uh, but also just, like, an upgrade over Avante Maddox and someone who's ultimately, hopefully, more available uh, and on the field more than an Avante Maddox, too. Um, and I will say, with Vic Fangio coming over, like, I could see a world where Bradbury and Slay in their age fit better in that quarters heavy defense versus like a man heavy defense with Sean Desai and Matt Patricia like this defensive you know scheme change might ultimately make those guys look a little better so I'm making this pick focusing on slot but also if you're an Eagles fan and you know about Cooper Jean this could be your like free safety of the future so you know just get him into camp find out where he's best at free safety or slot whichever one of those two could be an upgrade here for the Philadelphia Eagles and that secondary which I know Eagles fans don't want to hear it, but it's got to get better. Uh, then we get to the Houston Texans at 23. I'm going to go lay out to Latu. They could easily lose Jonathan Grenard. He's coming off a breakout season. Feels like a you know one of those young guys coming off that breakout year. They're going to get a bag. Um, and Houston's got the money to spend for sure because Stroud's on a rookie contract. Will Anderson's on a rookie contract. Got a corner on a rookie contract too. So they got they're they're it's almost like you when you draft expensive positions and those guys hit it, it creates a huge cap advantage. It's it's almost like position value matters in the NFL draft. Um, but this, I could see where if they do lose Grenard, you know, lay out to lots of plug and play options. This guy's NFL ready. Doesn't have the athleticism or the quicks or the explosiveness that a Grenard does, but this guy needs no work. Like this guy is NFL ready from a move standpoint, uh, from a hand standpoint, uh, and I think he's got enough athleticism to where he's not going to be a liability on the field whatsoever. I think he he's got the athletic ability to to play at the NFL level. So he falls into their lap at 23, and Houston gets a plug and play replacement for Jonathan Grenard, depending on what happens in free agency. To the Dallas Cowboys at 24. I'm going to go Tyler Guyton here. Uh, I think another tackle just like Latham that has the goods and the ability to flip over and play left tackle if they want to explore that could also be an upgrade at right tackle over Terrence Steele. Um, I think they bring back uh, Tyron Smith for a one-year deal, probably like $14, $15 million, maybe 16 or something like that. One-year deal for Tyron Smith. He plays left tackle. Tyler Smith sticks at left guard. And then Guyton probably battles it out with Terrence Steele at right tackle. If he's better, you play Guyton, even though you're paying Steele. And then next offseason, you have a decision on your hands. Do you want to flip Guyton? Is it going to stay at right tackle? What are you doing with Smith? But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Guyton, really good value here. Big winner at the Senior Bowl. Love the upside. And this is an organization that's Really tapped into upside. Look at Tyler Smith, case in point. Uh, let's get to the Green Bay Packers here at 25. A little something different. And this is probably going to irritate people who are big you know, Johnny Newton fans. But he's got that surgery now that he's going through. And I still think Newton's <sighs> Newton deserves to go somewhere in the top 35, which he is going to go in top 35 here. But I see both the Texas interior defensive linemen as the top guys in this class. Sweat's going to play nose tackle. Newton's going to play three tackle. So they're kind of two different interior defensive linemen. But, you know... Green Bay, the reason I decided to go sweat here instead of a Newton is like Kenny Clark plays three tech, Wyatt plays three tech, they need a nose. And to find a sweat is that plug and play. We're going to stop the run. There is pass rush upside, but we're going to keep Clark and Wyatt clean and let those guys be awesome pass rushers at the R. And then you get the pass rush upside that comes with Javondre Sweat because just like what I've been saying for years now with Vita Vea, like you're too strong. There needs to be three to four snaps a game where you just put that center in the QB's lap and just blow a play up. And sometimes you get that from Vea, sometimes you don't. 
Devondre Sweat pretty consistently will do it two to three times a game. So I like the idea of bringing that pass rush upside in between Wyatt and uh, Sweat, plus the run game reinforcements, keeping Quay Walker and Devondre Campbell clean in the run game. You know, I just love it across the board here. And again, he's my IDL two at the moment. Tampa Bay at 26 is actually going to go ahead and have a trade back. I'm going to do something very different in my next mock. So if you're a Bucks fan, you're like, why are we trading out of the first round? I hate this. Or if you're a Giants fan, you're like, oh my God, he's doing it again. Please stop. Uh, why do you keep making my team trade up? Uh, I'm trying to find where the Giants pick is. There it is. Uh, so it's going to be 39. Uh, moving up to uh, 26 for the cost of uh, swap. 70 is going to go. And then 127 back the other way. So uh, the Giants are going to you know, move up 13 spots, but at the expense of uh, falling back another 57. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's, kinda, it's, it's a tough move there because I think that third rounder would be something that the Giants would be benefited to have. Uh, and full transparency, when I was planning this out, I was going to have the Giants take Spencer Rattler at that spot. Ultimately not going to do that. And what I'm going to have them do is, after going Romo Dunze at six, draft Marius Mims. I know he only played eight games in college, but you know, his Ohio State game from two seasons ago alone is probably going to have him go in the first round. Um, and the upside's there. And if he hits, huge upgrade at right tackle. You move Evan Neal inside to play left guard, which has also been a problem spot. Hopefully that upgrades Neal's play, and hopefully it upgrades the position itself. So Giants fans, you're probably not in love with this because you probably want that third rounder to be something that you're using. And I totally get that. Next draft, uh, next mock draft, we're not going to have them moving up in the first round again. I did that in my last mock too. Uh, but you get a receiver and a right tackle in the first round. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty awesome way to, you know, in one day, patch up the two biggest holes on that off to, or on that offense in general. So, I don't know. It might be worth. It might be worthwhile, but I don't know. Pick seven's a pretty pick seventy. Excuse me, is a pretty tough one uh, to part ways with. Arizona Cardinals, Nate Wiggins. We've done this in the last three mocks now. Him and Garrett Williams. I, I see a whole lot of similarities between the two. Williams just had his season cut short because of injury against Notre Dame, but we might have been saying a lot of the same stuff about Williams that we're talking about with Nate Wiggins. And Wiggins right now, my outside corner one. So great value here at 27. Love the athleticism. I think him and Garrett Williams both have great man coverage traits while also having plenty of experience playing off zone. So a lot of flexibility for Jonathan Gannon there running that defense with these two guys as the spearhead corners on the outside. Keytrail Clark then playing on the inside. Love it. Just love it across the board for the Cardinals. Pick 28. I'm going to have the Buffalo Bills draft Braylon Trice. Um, look, Von Miller, kind of a non-factor. We'll see if they decide to have him come back. I've heard some of that uh, floated out there. Uh, where is my boy Braylon Trice? There he is. Um, but, you know, Greg Rousseau's, Greg Rousseau is a good player, uh, but I feel like they need more, especially if they do decide to part on part ways with Vaughn Miller. So Braylon Trice, insanely high motor, speed to power guy. And I feel like they don't have a speed to power guy. Like Rousseau wins with kind of flexibility inside out, arm length. Epineza, you know, kind of has a little bit of that power profile, but that's not really Vaughn Miller either. So it feels like Braylon Trice is just kind of an upgrade over AJ Epineza. I don't know if they're really looking for that, but to me, it's a different pass rusher than what they have, specifically compared to Rousseau and Miller. So I like it a ton. I think back into the first round, good place to graft a Braylon Trice. 29, I'm going to go back to the well. Same pick I had from my last mock, Darius Robinson. Uh, just feels like the perfect guy that can play outside on early downs, give you some better... Um, Run defense, uh, run defense support because you know Aiden Hutchinson I think is the world best edge at that, uh, and, he, and you know <laughs> James Houston is certainly you know not a high level run defender, so I think you keep him as a DPR. Robinson plays on the outside early downs, then you kick him inside on uh, passing situations. Line him up next to the Lee McNeil, Hutchinson, Houston then comes on the field as that DPR. Love how that sets up that defensive line and just it keeps Houston clean. You can use Robinson all three downs, so it's a great value at 29. I just I, I love this fit across the board. Now, this is like it's weird that the last three picks of the first round are the ones that I was like most excited to talk about, but uh, I'm gonna have AD Mitchell go to the Baltimore Ravens. Um, you see flashes of the upside that's there as a route runner, and I think that's what this team's missing that like man press beater and with speed upside as a route runner and plus just his contested catch go up and win in the air ability. AD Mitchell feels like that man beating wide receiver that they just don't have right now. He's also easily the biggest target that they have, other than, like, Mark Andrews, of course. But, like, comparing Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman to A.D. Mitchell, it, it's not even close. Like, this is the vertical threat, go up and win in the air guy, minimum. But I also think with the route running upside and his size and his uh, release... I think this guy could eventually become a really nice player at getting off the line of scrimmage because of the athleticism. Um, so, yeah, this could definitely be the man-beating receiver that this team's kind of missing. And then we get to the San Francisco 49ers. Really intrigued by the idea of them going chop Robinson here. Like, there's no guarantee they bring back, you know, Randy Gregory or Chase Young. Yeah, they picked him up at the deadline uh, or midseason. I think Gregory was just a signing. But no guarantee they bring either one of those dudes back. So could chop Robinson be, like, the next, like... Um, 
kind of toolsy, traitsy guy that goes to San Francisco and all of a sudden like has it figured out. Like think about Charles Menehue. Kind of a disappointing pick for Houston. Goes to San Francisco. Now he's playing for a double-digit million dollars a year. And I kind of feel like Clayton Furl might be on that career arc, too. We'll see. It makes sense for him to go back to San Francisco for another year. Um, but he could kind of have that similar turnaround just because the defensive line coach in San Francisco is, is just a wizard of what he does. So, Chop Robinson, off the charts, athleticism, has the frame. I think plays pretty strong at 250 pounds to stop the run. He's just got to get refined as a pass rusher. So, not many better places to go than San Francisco. Then we get to the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm going to go key on Coleman. Freaky athlete. Yes, he needs to improve as a route runner, but it's the ball skills and it's the athleticism that does it for me here with this fit in Kansas City. And you got to think, like, there were a lot of big plays between Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill where it was generated by Tyreek Hill just being a nasty deep route runner and getting open, for sure. But there's also a lot of those big plays where it's just like Mahomes breaks contain, is playing backyard football, and Tyreek Hill's fast enough to get away from anybody. So it's a huge chunk play, or Tyreek Hill weaves to the defense and it's six for Kansas City. So it's kind of just that impromptu off the script. You don't need to be a great rounder. You just got to be a great football player and kind of be on the same page as Pat. Who's to say Keon Coleman couldn't be that, right? And with his ball skills and his size, he makes the perfect sense and, and plenty of athleticism to be like, okay, Pat Mahomes is rolling out right. I need to make my way to that side of the field. Boom, chunk play for the Chiefs. Like, I could totally see him being that like an off-script target that Pat always, always is always looking for, excuse me. Um, and that might buy him time to grow as a route runner. Um, but I also think like if they kind of tap into that, I'd be really interested to see what his three cone is. And I want to compare that to T. Higgins because that's kind of been like I saw a little bit more wiggle in Higgins at Clemson that I was like, okay, he could become a decent route runner. I think the true the potential is there, and that is the same thing is true for Keon Coleman. So I think he can get there, long story short, and I would love to see that. So him going to Kansas City, hopefully they tap into that route running, but Minimum, bigger wide receiver than they have right now. Tons of athleticism, great ball skills, and uh, I think he could definitely be that, you know, kind of play, play breaks down, backyard football. Pat is looking for Keon Coleman, that type of target that they haven't had since Tyreek's departure. Let's get into the second round now. I'm going to have Ladd McConkie be the pick here for the Carolina Panthers. It feels like, um, you know, just Adam Thielen just starting all over again in a lot of ways, you know, uh, just upgrading that position for sure, getting younger, getting cheaper at that spot. And, uh, you know, Daniel Jeremiah, I think, kind of summed it up. He tweeted out earlier this week, I think, uh, a lot of cornerback notes where he's writing the same thing. Struggled against McConkie. I know he's going to get those Wes Walker, Julian Edelman. That's a really lazy way of going about it just because he's a small, you know, probably slot at the next level. But field stretching ability. He'll run in the four threes to low four fours. Very quick out of breaks. See, he's a more athletic Julian Edelman to me. Like, if you're going to make that comp, he's a more athletic version of that because that maybe he could play outside some and be a field stretcher. But either way, again, Adam Thielen plus here. Um, and I think you bring him in, play him in the slot. This team probably shells out some big money for like a Mike Evans type. And all of a sudden that receiver room's not looking too, too bad for the Carolina Panthers. And then we get to the New England Patriots. I'm going to go Kingsley Suamataia. Back-to-back weeks where I do this, but big, you know, massive offensive tackle going to New England. Don't be surprised if this is something that I do explore and want to tap into. And I've, I've even kind of thought about like, is there a world where I could get Joe Alt? to New England. I don't know. It's worth thinking about. Depends on how they feel about Daniels, but I feel like they just they can't pass him a quarterback at three. That, that'd be a slippery slope to try to work through. But anyways, Kiesa Suomata, yeah, yes, a little bit of a project, but I think New England, even with the new coaching staff coming in, solid track record of developing these guys. The upside's there for Suomata, yeah, tackle, underrated need for the New England Patriots, and we can still go receiver in the third round, which is exactly what we're going to do, and I think they're going to get one of my favorite guys once we get in the third round. Then to the Arizona Cardinals. Let's go Johnny Newton here. I think this team makes a lot of sense for a, just a matter of week A signing. But, you know, since we don't know that yet, Jerzon Newton, yes, he's having that surgery. But I still think, you know, like right here at 35 feels like a, a pretty solid floor for him. Uh, pass rush juice, a pretty solid run defender too. That defensive interior in Arizona is a mess. Clear upgrade here with Johnny Newton. 36, I'm going to have the Washington Commanders select Jordan Morgan. Uh, someone that, you know, Jim Nagy was just tweeting about, putting out some more clips from his senior bowl. Uh, I know some people kind of saw him as a loser. Some people saw him as a winner. I, I was somewhere there in the middle. Um, and, and, you know, Nagy's more positive. But I still think because it's a good tackle class and what he showed at Arizona, even if it was more of a so-so week at Mobile, he's probably still going to go somewhere in the top 50. Left tackle, an obvious need here for Washington. Um, and you could even, if you if you feel like, hey, Leno's not the worst option right now, you could play Morgan at left guard just to start out. But this is probably a, an immediate option to play <laughs> left tackle for this offense because I, I assume this Washington team is eager to move on from Charles Leno. Then we get to the uh, Los Angeles Chargers. Kool-Aid McKinstry, easy pick here. They just need to get better at corner. They need to get longer and bigger at corner. If you have Asante Samuel out there, I feel like you need another big body guy. And that's exactly what Kool-Aid McKinstry is. And he's not going to be the best athlete in this class because of that. I do think he could fall a little bit. Um, and that's kind of why you know I got him going top of the second round instead of somewhere in the first. But 
three-year starter at Alabama, just gets the position, football savvy, you know, just high football IQ, just technically gets the position. You can totally see where Harbaugh's like, yeah, that's a guy that can bolster my secondary immediately. To the Tennessee Titans, then at pick number 38, I'm going to go Xavier Worthy. Love the idea of, again, you sign Tyler Boyd in free agency, keeping him with Brian Callahan. Traylon Burks can be, you know, yards after the catch guy, gadget dude, using him on end arounds, just for lack of a better, for lack of a uh, better comparison, I'm not saying he's Debo Samuel, but just use him as a Debo Samuel in this offense in a lot of ways, just like that type of guy you can do a lot of different things with, but you just want to get him in space, get the ball in his hands, and let him be a tank to bring down. And then Xavier Worthy as that over-the-top threat. Feels like that trio in specific really complements one another a ton. So like that a lot. Um, and uh, Xavier Worthy here at 38. Once he runs in the four twos, like this is this is where we're gonna start seeing him going mocks. Like this is probably a little early for some people, but he's gonna run four two at the combine. So he's gonna he's gonna go probably in this range uh, once we get through Indy. Let me get to Tampa Bay at 39. I'm gonna go Troy Fautano. So you trade back what uh, 13 spots, and then you get an immediate Matt Filer upgrade at left guard. Got to be excited about that. Um, you know, if if Fontano becomes the pick for Miami, this is also an interesting Graham Barton spot. Basically, just flipping these picks. Could he play center? Interesting idea. Could could go Zach Frazier here. I, I'm more so Zach Frazier. Like once we get to pick 50 ish, is kind of like when we start thinking about it. Um, specifically 52. Like I think the Steelers make a lot of sense. In this case, Chicago has that pick. That also makes a ton of sense. But. Fautano falls all the way back here to Tampa Bay. Immediate upgrade at left guard. We'll figure out center. Cody Mock hopefully takes a step forward at right guard. And we're feeling good about that moving forward, at least for right now in Tampa Bay. Then we get back to Washington. They're on the clock here at pick 40. I'm going to go Chris Braswell. A pick that I've done on a fair amount, but edge here at 36 or 40 makes a lot of sense. If Chop Robinson's available, I think that's a guy they'll target. But for right now, they'll go with the other kind of upside play. Not a whole lot of playing, uh, playing time under his belt at Alabama, but... Great first step explosive, the speed to power guy for sure with the ability to bend, dip. Uh, and because you have that to go with that speed to power ability, it makes him a really interesting prospect. Was a guy that, had he had a huge senior week, probably puts himself firmly in the first round. But it was a little bit more so-so, kind of middle of the road. Uh, not a bad week, but not a good week. So I kind of feel like somewhere here in the top 40, you know, in that uh, 28 to... Uh, 46 range makes a lot of sense for Chris Braswell. Let me get to the Green Bay Packers. First of two picks they have here in the second round. Cam Kitchens is going to be a pick that I continue to do a ton for this team. Safety is a massive need. Makes too much sense to me. The top safety in this class can play in the slot, can play over the top, can play in the box. You name it, he can do it for Green Bay. Minnesota Vikings at pick number 42. Back to the edge group. Let's go with Disa Isaac. As promised, we were going to attack edge here. So Byron Murphy to immediately be the best interior defensive lineman on this team. Adisa Isaac. So hopefully if you keep Daniel Hunter around or hopefully, you, no, Daniel Hunter. If you're going to keep any of the guys they have, keep Daniel Hunter. Pair him up with Adisa Isaac. Love that a ton. I will say Isaac does come with some run game concerns, but... This team needs to generate more pass rush. Like, you cannot have Brian Flores have his defensive philosophy be another year where we're going to show eight every play. And basically, we're alternating between we're going to show eight, bring eight, or show eight, only rush three. Like, you can't just have that be the Brian Flores defense in Minnesota. You need to give him legitimate pass rush talent. So, where Isaac, yes, might be a little bit of a concern against the run, I, I think you're willing to swallow that pill here to bolster that pass rush. Atlanta Falcons next at 43. I told you it was going to be offensive heavy. One of my favorite receivers in this class is Jalen Polk. I see him as a slot player, but... At Washington, 50-50 between playing outside and inside. But I just love his hands. 6'2", 200 plus pounds. I love that physical body. Again, I've comped with Chris Godwin a ton. But Chris Godwin is this bigger, can make those tough catches over the middle. Like That's what I see a lot of in Jalen Polk. Plus the ability to stretch the field a little bit. Plus yak skills on top of that. So also a really good blocker. I like adding that into this offense that has a Tyler Algier, has a Bijan Robinson. So him as the number two pass game uh, you know, receiver, at least, uh, to Drake London. Kyle Pitt's still there. J.J. McCarthy in this Zach Robinson, you know, Sean McVay-esque offense. I'm pumped up about that. And, like, could Polk as a slot receiver in this, you know, L.A.-inspired offense, could he play that Cooper Cup role in this offense? I, I think he could. Let's get to the Raiders then at 44. Uh, I kind of mentioned this at uh, the first round pick. You know, when a guy has, like, physicality as one of his top traits, it's just like, hmm. Feels like a lost space Raider, you know. Feels like he should go to that franchise. And that's Rake Straw, you know, had this injury. Uh, so that, that's kind of pushed him down the board a little bit, I think. He's still got first round talent in my eyes. We'll see what the 40 is. That'll obviously answer a lot of questions. Um, and whether it's at the combine or it's pro day, we'll eventually get that number. But again, I love that physicality. I think the Raiders can definitely get better at the cornerback spot. You got Nate Hobbs, but, you know, then you got Jack Jones, who he's had some flashes, but he's also come with some concerns and, you know, day three pick for some reasons. So can you fully rely on that? We don't know. TBD on that. So 
Ennis Rickshaw gives you at least one other guy to partner up with uh, Nate Hobbs. I think Hobbs is going to continue to play in the slot. That would force Ennis Rickshaw to play outside. I kind of like using him in both spots, inside and out. But if he has to play outside, I, I think that's still an upgrade over an Amik Robinson, Robertson in that type of role. And I also think Robertson is a free agent. So corner makes a ton of sense here in the second round. Then we get to the New Orleans States at 45. This is where I'm going to have Michael Penix come off the board. And basically, yeah, you restructure Derek Carr. It feels pretty hard to move on from him, not only this year, but... 2025 too so sorry Saints fans yeah might be stuck with them but I will say this whole time I've been saying Michael Penix needs to go to one of these McVay offenses and McVay Shanahan the offenses are similar but they're still different for sure they're, they're different but there's still some similar qualities to them and could Michael Penix go to New Orleans where now Clint Kubiak the past game coordinator QB coach this last year in San Francisco is now the offensive coordinator. I think that one makes Derek Carr better because I think it's a good offense for him to plug into. And plus, we've seen a lot of quarterbacks just naturally get better in that style, that style of play. But you could also just have Michael Penix there. And, you know, I feel like he's a great fit for McVay's offense. There could be the same thing that's true about a, a Shanahan disciple. So could be an interesting fit. And then, hey, you know what? If Penix is better than Derek Carr and you're still having to pay Carr, at least you're getting an upgrade at the quarterback position. So um, just one I haven't done yet and I wanted to talk about it. But uh, it'd be really interesting to see if, New Orleans is still kind of keeping their eye on the market, specifically if a guy makes it to the second round. Like if Bo Nix falls or Michael Penix falls, are they in on that market even after paying Derek Carr? It's just one of those questions that I, I'm dying to have an answer to. Indianapolis Colts are up next. I'm going to go Chris Jenkins here. About as early as I've had him go in any of these mocks. But when you look at their on-off splits, uh, specifically against the run with Grover Stewart on or Grover Stewart off the field, it's stark. So th- they need to bring back Grover Stewart. But in the world where they don't, some team pays him a ton to be their like marquee run stopper. Could become a need. So you put Chris Jenkins, one of the best run-stopping uh, defensive interior players in this class, next to um, DeForest Buckner. Continue to let you know Buckner do what he does as a pass rusher. Jenkins keeps him clean with that run game reinforcements. To me, the fit makes a ton of sense if they lose out on Stewart in free agency. Pick 46, I'm going to give the New York Giants Kamari Laster. Kind of the poor man's Kool-Aid McKintree, three-year starter. Started as a true freshman. Not necessarily the most you know God-gifted athlete. Doesn't have the most insane size. I think Kool-Aid's gonna kind of beat him, got him beat there. But with Shane Bowen coming over from Tennessee, he did not have a whole lot of corner talent to work with during his time there. And the Giants are kind of the spot. Yeah, first round pick Deontay Banks there, but Adoree Jackson's a free agent. I don't know if they're going to pay him. So outside corner could end up becoming a pretty pretty big need pretty quick. So I like the idea of just getting a great sound, you know, technically refined cornerback to be able to plug and play if they do lose out on Adoree Jackson. Jacksonville then at 48. I'm going to go Jonah Ellis. I've been saying forever this team needs that extra pass rusher. Walker's still developing. Josh Allen, they got to pay him to bring him back because he's easily the lifeline of that pass rush. Bringing in Jonah Ellis with an NFL-ready spin move, I think, you know, evens out that rotation where it's not just, you know, Josh Allen has to win this game for us basically on defense. It's, okay, Ellis could be a contributor. Allen's still the headline guy. Because of that, Ellis is going to get one-on-ones. Hopefully Trayvon Walker takes a step forward and all of a sudden it feels like you got three really nice pass rushers that can continue to work the load and, you know, one guy's off one week, the next guy steps up, that sort of stuff. Then the Cincinnati Bengals at 49. Uh, actually, The Athletic and Dane Brugler just put out a great story about Karan Amegaji. I uh, finally got that uh, pronunciation uh, finalized. I've, I've seen it posted and phonetically spelled out so many different ways, but I'm going to go with Dane's pronunciation here, and I think Karan makes a ton of sense here for the Cincinnati Bengals. Could be their left guard. Did play a year there for Yale, but I think he's an athletic enough guy, um, and if he made the guard to tackle transition, albeit both on the left side, I still feel like he could flip over to the right side. Wouldn't shock me. Um, we're seeing that a little bit more nowadays, but this is kind of twofold. Either it's an upgrade at left guard if you feel like you can't make that flip, we'll figure out right tackle and free agency, or you have him flip positions. He's your right tackle. You're moving on from Jonah Williams. I think that's the ideal situation. Unless Jonah Williams wants to play left guard, then I'd be cool with bringing him back for that position. But I assume his time in Cincinnati is done. I think both sides are ready to move on. So uh, Amagaji, either as your right tackle or as your left guard in Cincinnati. Got to improve that off the line. Keep Joe Burrow upright. Philadelphia here at 50. I think Eagles fans are going to love the second round. Troy Franklin, is this just... Quez Watkins upgrade, pretty clear here. Like, way better yards after the catch guy. Uh, Quez is, like, a really nice punt returner, but I feel like, actually, like, yards after the catch, like, he kind of leaves some to be desired as a receiver. Uh, But also, an abundance of long speed, so you're not losing that at that number three receiver. Like, Franklin's going to be, you know, just as fast as Quez Watkins, or at least in that area. Um, And and, uh, actually plays pretty physical has pretty good contested catch rate for someone who's like 180 pounds listed at i think that's what oregon's got him at 180 185 like to see him add a little bit more mass you know beef up a little bit but nonetheless like again plays really physical at that size great long speed improved yards after catch option compared to quest Watkins. in my opinion again i know he's a special teamer so he should be better there i just feel like in the actual receiver spot he's just he's not as good as he is as a returner anyways troy franklin to me pretty clear upgrade is that receiver three 
Los Angeles Rams next up at 51. We're actually going to have a trade here. I'm going to have the Green Bay Packers moving up. Um, so let's find the Green Bay Packers, 57. So 57, swap with 51. And then ultimately, it's going to be another pick swap, 91, 100. And then 168 going to the Los Angeles Rams. So uh, more steps in this. But you can kind of see it here just over my head. That's all five picks that are going to be included. Green Bay moves up. And I'm going to have them. Uh, apparently, you know, with this Jeff Halfley uh, higher a defensive coordinator, apparently the plan is to play more press man. I, I don't know what it is, so I'm just going off of what I've heard there. But TJ Tampa has all the traits to be a really nice man press corner. It's just something Iowa State didn't do a whole lot in their defense. So he should be a great man press corner. We just haven't seen a whole lot of it. But I'm willing to make that projection because he totally fits that mold of corner. So we've given this defense a, a, a a versatile safety you can play all over the field. And now we've given a corner to run with Eric Stotes or Jair Alexander, depending on what happens there, to be that man press corner. Ultimately, I do, I do think they move on from Jair. I think Jair is wanting to go. But this, if this is truly a man press defense, I think it's a better fit for Eric Stokes. He ran a ton of that at Georgia. So Stokes plus Tampa, kind of my assumption right now. Then Cam Kent over the top. Really like the direction we're kind of moving the secondary in for Green Bay. All right, now we get to Chicago again. This is kind of a great time for Zach Frazier to potentially come off the board, but it's going to be a little bit later on for me. I'm going to go Ricky Pearsall here. Uh, another great field stretching option, but with a little bit more size than DJ Moore has and also like really nice ball tracking skills, really like the contested catch ability and also has like one of the greatest catches in college football history. So you see the ball skills fully put on display in just that one clip. Um, I wanted to find a way where I could have Pierce Hall go to Indianapolis. Maybe next week I'll have like Indy trade down. Because I think 46 is a little too rich for me, but you get in the 50s, okay, I can c consider it. So maybe I'll just try to have Indianapolis trade down next week so I can have Pierce Hall reunite with Anthony Richardson. That would be sick. Uh, and to me, an upgrade over Alec Pierce. But here, Pierce Hall is going to be that number two. Maybe you bring back Darnell Moody. He plays in the slot. But I like Pierce Hall. I like DJ Moore in this vertical-based Shane Waldron offense with Caleb Williams throwing the football. Let's chuck it. I like Pierce Hall as a fit in Chicago. Then we get to Miami. Uh, I've done this a thousand times, so I'll be, I'll be brief here. But JT Sanders, pretty clear to me, number two tight end. There's just really no one else that athletically, to me, like kind of matches that. Um, and I think if Quinn Ewers is better, if there were less mouths to feed in you know, Texas, he might have had the production to be drafted even higher. But love the movement skills. I... I, I, he's not the world's greatest blocker, but I think in the zone blocking scheme, he's got enough there to fit with what Mike McDaniel wants to do. And he's definitely a better blocker than Mike Gusecki. So like I said a thousand times, I think this is as close to a George Kittle that Miami is going to have the chance to draft unless they somehow move up the board and draft Brock Bowers. Because then, yeah, sure, you've kind of got the closest thing to uh, Kittle since, you know, uh, Kittle. <laughs> but I uh, don't see a world where they do that. And considering they're kind of light on picks, this team makes more sense to trade back then I would say to trade up. So because of that, JT Sanders, much more of an option in my eyes than Brock Powers is for Miami. So love the fit there at 53. On to pick 54. Back to the Philadelphia Eagles is where I'm going to have Edge come off the board. Edge and Cooper, this team needs to get an upgrade at linebacker. I think Cooper's size and specifically arm length paired up with the Kobe Dean. Perfect fit because Dean, not only the injury concerns coming into Georgia, but he's a smaller, not as long of arms. He's, these two guys kind of feel like perfect complements with their body types. Uh, but Dean, that, you know, he's super athletic and shoot gaps is great football field he's just got to be actually on the field so i like the idea of pairing him up with uh edrin cooper and i'd also be interested because like cooper has some reps uh you know as a pass rusher playing outside linebacker i wonder if that's something vic fancy would tap into and try to bolster that pass rush that got a little quieter down the stretch for philadelphia which caused some concerns i think also kind of made the secondary look a little worse than maybe it actually was you know i still think they need to get better there but you know, maybe with the pass rush taking a step back, it made those guys in the back end look a little bit rougher. Anyways, let's move on to the uh, Cleveland Browns. I think this might be one of my favorite player to team landing spots, Roman Wilson. Field stretching guy, uh, can play outside or inside. We saw the senior bowl, like this guy's just fine outside. Can kind of be that Tyler Lockett. Yeah, he's a little small, but hey, he works. It doesn't matter. It matter. Or you do play him on the inside, and I actually think Wilson probably as an underneath route runner, a sharper guy than Tyler Lockett is. I think Lockett really is a vertical based guy, and then he hits the brakes and catches those curl routes and then falls down. You know, like I think that's Tyler Lockett's game. I think Wilson brings a little bit more nuance as a route runner. Maybe it's also just like the age component. I've seen Lockett now last couple of years tail in his career. Anyways, different talk for a different day. Let me get back on track here. But Roman Wilson, another receiving option. Hopefully, a year or two lead from Cedric Wilson. You still have Amari Cooper there. And then hopefully, you get even more out of Elijah Moore. So, all of a sudden, it's like four receivers that can do all very different things. Just trying to diversify the portfolio that those pass catchers bring to, to the table for Deshaun Watson. Dallas Cowboys are next up. Uh... And this can't be... Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Got ahead of myself. The next pick. Okay, I was, I was like, wait a minute, what? Jonathan Brooks is going to be the pick here at 56. It was uh, very close to being Tyler Newbin, who's going to be the next pick here. But Brooks, I mean, I think if this team 
you know, as long, I assume they bring back Tony Pollard. And if there's going to be a team that knows anything about Jonathan Brooks, they have the same team doctor that UT does. So they're going to know about Jonathan Brooks as well as anybody else, if not better than any other team. So Brooks is the in-between tackles guy. Hopefully they bring back Pollard on a, like a reasonable number. He's the outside the tackles guy and the receiving threat. Brooks also, I think, is a solid blocker in the backfield. Uh, so I think I think this fit makes a ton of sense. And even if they miss out on Pollard, like Deuce Vaughn is that receiving scat back outside the tackle guy. Compliment to Jonathan Brooks. I also think that uh, one-two punch could totally work in Dallas. As noted, Tyler Newman could be the pick here for the Los Angeles Rams. Um, and I mean, John Johnson III, it was just a one-year deal in LA and he wasn't all that great. So let's get cheaper. Let's get younger at the position. Let's reinvent it. And we added Dallas Turner, you know, clear steal. One of the biggest steals of this first round mock. That athletic type with... Byron Young going into year two, Aaron Donald still there, Kobe Turner going into year two, looking like a force. Um, that pass rush now adding in a center fielder uh, at free safety, just kind of roam and wait for those mistakes to come his way. I love it. I love this fit a ton. Uh, I, I like it a ton. They'll, they'll still probably run a lot of split safety looks, but nonetheless, at least half the field. Newbin can be a playmaker there, so... Love the pass rush that we've kind of built up for the Rams, and I love having that guy in the back end that can make QBs, uh, you know, uh, make QBs pay for the mistakes that they might make because of the pass rush that's in their face. So I, I love this a ton. And plus, John Johnson III, I think he should do better than. And I think Tyler Newman, 57, good value for where he should go in the NFL draft. Pick 58, Tampa Bay. I'm going to give an edge rusher here and Gabriel Murphy. Just a super productive player at UCLA. Pass rush grades are elite for PFF. Also, the production's fantastic. You know, 260 pounds. So I think he's big enough to play all three downs. I, I like the combination of power plus bend and finesse. Like, to me, he's just kind of a jack of all trades. Don't know if he has one, like, elite thing that he brings to the table, but it's just, okay, he's pretty good at that. He's pretty solid at this. He can do that. Um, and I think... You know, I think all that kind of comes together and you just get a really solid, productive NFL player at the next level. Again, probably won't be a dude who's like 18, 20 sacks a year, but like if he's in that 8 to 12 range on the other side of Joe Tryon Shanka, I'm feeling better about that pass rush, specifically at the edge spot in Tampa. Uh, pick 59, I'm going to give the Houston Texans uh, Jalen McMillan. I, I know a lot of people like uh, Malachi Corley, you know, this Bobby Slowe coming from San Francisco. Could Corley kind of be there? Debo type for sure, totally could be. But Jalen McBillion, you know, six foot one, right around two hundred pounds. Like he's not small. Like he's not small either. Uh, yeah, he missed some time this year, but a great slot receiver, ton of juice, ton of change of direction skills. So field stretcher could also be a yak guy. I think a sharp right runner too. Like I think this could be an impact guy from all three levels. He was on my receiver honorable mentions in the way too early receiver rankings I did. I've always been pretty high on Jalen McMillan. Um, and that was actually before like I had Polk on my radar. So Polk wasn't in that video, but McMillan was. So that, that should tell you everything uh, that you need to know about how I feel about McMillan. So I love the upside here. He plays the slot. Collins, Tank Dell on the outside. Love that receiver trio for CJ Stroud. Buffalo Bills are next up. Let's go back to the receiver position and go Xavier Leggett. Um, you know, not as big as Gabe Davis and not as big as we thought he would be going into the Senior Bowl, but I liked his ability to bounce back from a tough day one. Day two onward looked a lot better. Uh, I still like the physicality that he brings to the table. And honestly, as a yards after the catch weapon, he just, they might be looking for more of that bowling ball after the catch physical receiver than they are like six foot four, go make this insane catch 60 yards down the field. Yeah, Allen's got the arm for that, no doubt about it. And I think Leggett can be used that way. But we saw this offense shift to being like, we're going to look underneath and then time our shots up down the field versus like, we're always looking deep and then we're willing to uh, check down. That's to me the difference between Brady and Ken Dorsey and how that offense operated. So Leggett is just like a yards after the catch guy. I think kind of fits more with what Brady's looking for. And I think the dude's a bowling ball. <laughs> a really tough guy to bring down. Really strong. So I really like that fit there in Buffalo. Next up is the Detroit Lions. I'm going to go Cooper Beebe here. Uh, been a while since I've talked about Cooper Beebe in one of these videos. But uh, just long-time starter, tackle, then guard. Uh, I don't think the most athletic guy. But I think there's enough movement skills to work in that offensive line. Also, like, Penny Sewell. Like, if you're going to have a guy you know, pull, like, make a Panay Sewell or re-sign Jonah Jackson and have him be your pulling guard. I think right now you're just getting a, a, just a polished pass protector, uh, but also just, like, a mean dude. Like, in the run game where the movement skills aren't there, from a power standpoint, the guy's got it. He can crush the dude across from him. So, like that power element at the guard spot being plugged into this offensive line. And they have both their guards hitting free agency. I think they'll re-sign Frank Ragnow. I think that makes a ton of sense. So, BB next to him at left guard. Like that fit a lot for the Lions. Three more picks here in the second round. Um, if, like I said earlier, I think just a matter of week, the Cardinals make a lot of sense. There could be other teams that are definitely suitors. If the Ravens lose Justin Matabuike, what better player to replace him with than Michael Hall? Now, you will need Travis Jones and company to kind of keep him clean in the run game, but you saw it at the Senior Bowl. And, like, that's an event where, like, it's all about one-on-ones. And Michael Hall is built 
for a one-on-one. -on -one. So if you keep him clean in the run game, this dude's going to be an awesome pass rusher. And honestly, I think he could be an immediate impact pass rusher for this Baltimore defense. And there's also a world where you get Matt Abuike back and you can still use Michael Hall on the field. And all of a sudden, that interior pass rush is off the charts sick. And then we get to the San Francisco 49ers. Another week. Christian Haynes going pick 63. I didn't mean to hit corner there, but it's it's all good. Christian Haynes can play either guard spot. He did that at the Senior Bowl, but he played right guard his entire career. So you know, let's let's just say he plays right guard, or we flip him over to left guard. Actually, let's just say he flips over to left guard. He's a much better scheme fit to me than Aaron Banks ever was. And then you get to trade Banks. You know, I could see we're in a gap scheme like the Giants or the Ravens. Like that could be a lot of fun. New England. Like they could take advantage and buy low and get Banks for like a six rounder, and all of a sudden he becomes a great starter. Idea for those who are running a gap scheme somewhere across the NFL. But Christian Haynes, much better fit than Banks. Plug him in at left guard. Love that. And then Haynes and Trent Williams on the left side of that offensive line. Sheesh. Just might be another year where Opoy is easily Christian McCaffrey's to be had. All right. Last pick of the second round is going to be Patrick Paul, offensive tackle from Houston. Ton of pass blocking sets under his belt. Uh, yeah, not not a Power Five school, but. The arm length is insane. That's going to be uh, a huge calling card of his. Again, don't think he's the most athletic guy, but polished, techniques down, awesome arm length. Donovan Smith, you can upgrade that position one and two. He was on a one-year deal, so he's a free agent. So Kansas City definitely looking at the tackle market this year and get Paul falling down the board here. What what more could you ask for? All right, let's fly through the third round here. Carolina, they need another edge rusher. I think they could use a guy with some size. Marshawn Nealon, interesting prospect. Combination of size, speed, but also a little bit of bend there. So a little bit of a, a draft and develop guy, but could be a really fun player to add in there. I know they, they added DJ Johnson in the third round last year, but I'm more intrigued by Nealon than I was by DJ Johnson. Next up is the Arizona Cardinals. We're going to go to the off to tackle spot. Um, I can see a world where they keep Paris Johnson Jr. right tackle just for continuity sake. Christian Jones, big winner at the Senior Bowl. Really loved what I saw in the, as a pass protector specifically. Um, was kind of a guy that wasn't on my radar and certainly was put on it after that event. So playing him at left tackle, to me, makes a lot of sense. Eventually allows you to pave the way to move on from DJ Humphreys. Pick 67, I'm going to have the Washington Commanders select Peyton Wilson. They've been looking for an upgraded linebacker, and you know Dan Quinn has been able to get some good play out of Leighton Vander Ash. Michael Parsons is now full-time edge, so I'm not really grouping him in there. But even like a Marquise Bell last year, safety converted to play linebacker. When they could keep him clean in the run game, he was a pretty solid player. So um, I feel like linebackers going to be something he's prioritized. Uh, they definitely could spend like on a Devin White in free agency or even like a cheaper option like a Kenneth Murray. But if they don't get one of those guys, Peyton Wilson at 67, he could easily go top 50 because the talents there is just the injury history. And we'll say that pushes him down the board and Washington has him fall into their lap. Potential immediate upgrade there in the third round. Now we're going to give New England a wide receiver. And if you've been around for the, my mock drafts, you know Javon Baker's one of my guys. Six foot one and a half, super explosive. Like I think he's going to have a good 40, but I think that 10-yard split's going to be where he really catches people's attention. Uh, sharp enough route runner, one of those one-on-ones at the senior ball, really crushing in the red zone. So... To me, I see the juice that's there uh, as a as a up and coming route runner, size, speed, threat, plus that initial quickness at the line of scrimmage makes him a really tough guy to press at the line of scrimmage. I like this a ton, uh, and a, a, an upgraded Devontae Parker. Can we all agree uh, here for New England? Him, Pop Douglas, and then hopefully you sign one other guy in free agency. Try to build a nice receiving trio around Jaden Daniels. Plus, we got an off the tackle, which is a huge win. So, I think even in the third round, New England can kind of tap in this well and get a good player. It's just going to come down to them developing him. That's that's tougher. Then we get to the Cardinals at 69 once again. This is where Zach Frazier comes off the board. Uh, played center his whole career, if memory serves. Let me just pull that up before I, I find out I'm talking out of my ass. Yep, center his whole career at West Virginia. So, I think that's an immediate upgrade. This team absolutely can get better at center. Or he could shift over to play one of the guard spots, and that'd be an immediate upgrade. I think all three, eh, two of the three interior spots. Arizona can easily upgrade. I kind of have a soft spot for Will Hernandez. I think he's not as bad. Of, he's not terrible. Like, if he's your weakest link, you can live with that. Uh, so I think Frazier, left guard, center, upgrade there for Arizona where they need it. Uh, pick 70. Again, if this was the Giants taken here and they didn't move into the first round, this was going to be Spetzer Rattler. Instead, I'm going to have Tampa Bay go to the linebacker well and select Junior Colson. Just a rock-solid football player. Feels like a guy that, you know, Todd Bowles could look at and be like, this guy's not going to lose me any games. And I have Levante David on uh, on a one-year deal expiring. So he's a free agent. Devin White, like I said earlier, could definitely get paid big by uh, Minnesota, by uh, Washington, just to name a couple teams. So they might be down both their linebackers. To me, I think it's more realistic. Levante David comes back one more year. You partner him up with Junior Colson. Love that a ton. Not necessarily the most athletically gifted combination there, but just two sound, great football players. And then long-term, Colson learning from David, that could go a long way. Then we get back to the Arizona Cardinals once again. And again, we're going to go to the linebacker well. Let's go Cedric Gray here. Guy that, to me, really popped during the Senior Bowl. Uh, we're going to talk about one other guy here pretty shortly that did the same thing. And, uh, you know, I think the one-on-ones at the Senior Drill, like linebackers don't get a whole lot to take away just because... Like, they're covering running backs on, like, a play where there's no pass rush, so they're kind of left at the dry eventually. Um, but in the game, man, like, 
looked way better as a run defender than he really ever did at UNC, but also has great athleticism, sideline to sideline ability, and great feel over the middle of the field as a zone coverage defender. So to me, this is like a Jonathan Gannon drop backer, uh, but also, again, the senior bowl looked like a lot better of a run defender than I had anticipated. So could be learning and making some progress there. Uh, linebacker's just a spot where Arizona definitely could use an upgrade. We get to the New York Jets, and I'm just going to give them an upgrade at Alan Lazard here with Johnny Wilson. Big body, physical, solid blocker. Maybe eventually you move him into tight end. You know, Mike Renner, uh, formerly of the messenger and now he's a free agent messenger went under he didn't get fired uh but uh you know he he likes the idea of johnny wilson playing tight end so maybe you kind of phase him into that either way this team needs a number two pass catcher really like john and wilson as that alan lazard upgrade and hopefully as the perfect compliment to garrett wilson Next up, the Detroit Lions at 73. I'm going to give him a cornerback here, and one that's a really interesting fit for Aaron Glenn, who traditionally wants to run more man coverage. Last year started sprinkling a little bit more zone. Kyrie Jackson, six foot three, will be a great athlete. Showed that at the combine. We'll probably start rising up boards after that. Um, man press corner build archetype, like six foot three. Go get a guy in the line of scrimmage. Has the play strength and the long speed to recover. Like you'd love to see him as that man press corner. Uh, and I also like the fit because Cam Sutton a little small. Brian Branch is a slot. I'm not really worried about that. But, you know, in other mocks, I've given him these kind of 5'11", 6-foot corners. I'm like, eh, big receivers might give him a hard time. Kyrie Jackson, I'm less worried about that. I also think with his movement skills, if you do continue to play more zone, that'll be just fine. Like, I think he'll be a fine fit for Detroit no matter what the play call is. He just gives you more size than what you currently have at that position. Uh, pick 74, Atlanta. I'm going to give him Mike Sandra still. I know Richie Grant's played some some in the slot, but he also could just play some strong safety and be an upgrade potentially there. Uh, Sandra still just a clear upgrade at the slot corner position, in my opinion, no matter what happens with Richie Grant. Um, just love the coverage ability. To me, I see a, a poor man's Devon Witherspoon. Willing tackler, not the biggest guy, but you know plays through that. Sticky in coverage. Again, poor man's Devon Witherspoon. And get that guy on the inside. Love that for Atlanta. And uh, now let's get to Chicago at 75. I'm going to go Cedric Van Pran here. Um, to me, a little bit more of a gap scheme fit. But if you look at the, the PFF grade and uh, was it zone, uh, the zone grade 75.4, not too bad. So maybe there's some chance that uh, he actually fits the inside zone. Uh, I assume that Shane Waldron's bringing from Seattle. Uh, and if that's the case, that's, that's huge. Um, It'll be just one that I have to kind of reevaluate once we get closer to the combine uh, or post combine, honestly. Let me see what the 40 time is and kind of what those athletic traits are. And we'll compare it to the film. Did I see it? Did I not? Uh, and did what he fit in a zone blocking scheme? I've always seen him as a gap guy, but maybe, just maybe, there's enough movement skills. And that grade kind of swung me over. PFF kind of swung me in the direction that maybe he could fit an inside zone scheme. We're not asking him to play outside zone, just inside zone. So like, I think he could fit. I think he could be athletic enough to make it work. Anyways, moving on to pick number 76. As mentioned, another guy that really popped at the Senior Bowl was Braden Fisk. Uh, actually, I had to switch teams day of the game, which is pretty amazing, but especially in the game, dude. You saw, yeah, he's big, like he's north of 300 pounds, but super quick. Uh, I think a high-level run defender, but showcased some decent juice as a pass rusher. So pairing him up with uh, Zach Allen on the inside, I think that's a really nice pairing there for the Denver Broncos. Let's move on to the uh, Vegas Raiders here at 77. Going to go back to the interior defensive line well. You go Leonard Taylor. He's been kind of lost in the mix mix because you have Fisk, you know, kind of popping and Devondre Sweat's a massive human and everyone likes Johnny Newton and everyone's now loving Byron Murphy. So like everyone's kind of forgotten about Leonard Taylor and, you know, he's still kind of winning off, you know, the God given, you know, stuff like the sick arm length. He's a great athlete. Like he's winning with that versus like being a polished pass rusher. Um, but this is the chance for the Raiders to kind of buy low, like buy at the bottom of the market. And then over the course of a year or two, eventually get there. You know, like I, Max Crosby was a little bit more of a raw prospect, but had a great build and athleticism and was bulking up like, and they bought into that and eventually becomes a defensive player of the year, perennial candidate. So could they do the same thing here with Leonard Taylor? If they add that interior presence, it could go a long, long way. Love this team drafting Byron Murphy at 13, but they could also wait and get a steal here at 77 if Leonard Taylor hits. Pick 78. I'm going to go to the linebacker spot for the Seattle Seahawks. It's going to be Jeremy Trotter Jr. They have Devin Bush, the free agent, Bobby Wagner's a free agent and Jordan Brooks. I think in this spot, you bring back Brooks and then you draft Jeremy Trotter. You got to think Mike McDaniel coming from Baltimore where you had Patrick Queen, Roquan Smith. Linebacker's going to be a priority, I think, in his mind. So sideline to sideline ability for Trotter. Jordan Brooks is the downhill guy. I think you can kind of emulate what he had there in Baltimore with these two guys. And this is actually one that was inspired by Mike Renner. So shout out to the GOAT. Uh, let me get to the Atlanta Falcons at pick number 79. And I'm going to give uh, the Falcons an edge rusher that they desperately need. Austin Booker's an interesting one because, you know, he's six foot six, but listed at 245 pounds. So could you add 10 pounds? Because if so, then I feel like, okay, he could also play with the power. that They don't really have a power rusher at the edge spot. You know, Arnold Abichetti doesn't play like that. D'Angelo Malone, not really his game either. So could Booker eventually do that? Maybe. But at the least, you know, minimum, like, 
Abiketti doesn't win with arm length either. And, you know, at six foot six, we can assume that Booker's going to be pretty standout in that regard. So could he be that, you know, kind of long, lanky pass rusher that they maybe don't have? I definitely think he could be. And as a nice compliment there to Arnold Abiketti, could round out that pass rush. And also, like, they're just looking for a dude. So Booker, you know, kind of an up-and-coming name through the process, 79. Maybe he's the guy to break out for Atlanta at the edge spot. All right, next up is New Orleans to pick number 80. Uh, the, this team should probably move on from Marcus May. Uh, actually, I think they might have already done that, actually, now that I think about it. So moving on from Marcus May, Tyron Matthews is also a guy where like you could move on, or you could just ride out this one last year. Then he's got some void years, so maybe they just keep him around. But also, like, Alante Taylor, I, kind of an up-and-down year. I felt like Taylor was making progress, but you look at the PFF grades and specifically what he did in the slot, a little rough. I think Javon Bullard, whether it's Marcus May replacement or an upgrade over Alante Taylor in the slot, Bullard's got it. Love what I saw at the Senior Bowl. Love this slot class. This is a slot class that on in rounds three and four, if you feel like you need a playmaker in the middle of your defense, someone that can just be a run stopper, be used as a blitzer, take away those easy throws over the middle of the field, like this is the class for you and your team. Like third, fourth round, there's going to be a ton of these guys that fall, like Javon Bullard here in the third. Jarvis Brownlee Jr. is not going to go in this mock, so I would target him immediately at the top of round four, you know, things like that. You know, I think this is a great slot class. So <clears throat> I think that could be an immediate upgrade for the New Orleans Saints, or he could just play traditional safety like he did last year. But I think him and Tyke Smith are both slots, and you can't have two slots at Georgia. So one of them had to play over the top, and that's why Bullard played more traditional safety this last season. Pick number 81, I'll give the Seattle Seahawks Zach Zinter. So we drafted Jax Powers Johnson earlier, and I was like, you know, he could play guard or center, specifically left guard. And in this spot, I think Zach Zinter is your upgraded right guard. I think Phil Haynes, if they're going to bring back Lewis or Haynes, I'd prefer Lewis, personally. Um, I'm still not a great pass protector, but to me, much more in a way of like an actual impact player in the run game. So if you're going to bring back one, I'd bring back Lewis, personally. And then you play Zinter at right guard, JPJ at center. Oh, dream scenario. Or, alternatively, you both let both those guards walk. JPJ starts out at left guard. Olo Olo at Timmy, hopefully hits at center. Zach Center at right guard. Um, and Michigan, inside zone scheme. I expect to see the same thing from Kalen DeBoer. Uh, not Kalen DeBoer, excuse me. Ryan Grubb as the offensive coordinator in Seattle. So I think Center will ultimately be a fit in that blocking scheme. Play him at right guard. We'll figure out left guard center. But you got options there, uh, no matter how it shakes out in free agency with or without Lewis. So love it. And I think ultimately it's a big enough need where it wouldn't shock me if Seattle double dips. And they have a tendency to do that. Sometimes they'll double dip. So I, I like it a lot. Let me get to Indianapolis at 82. Uh, I'm going to give the Colts... Uh, Tez Walker. As mentioned earlier, I was trying to find a way where I can get Ricky Pearsall reunited with Anthony Richardson. And look, Tez Walker, big loser out of the, the, the senior bowl. Him and Kalen King's probably the, the two names you've heard the most as losers from that event. But look, I mean, he still had one of the fastest, maybe the fastest GPS time. So because of that, he's still going to go somewhere in the top 100. Like, if you're fast, someone will take a shot on you. Got to clean up the hands. And I also think, like, this year at UNC, like, the route running was a little more questionable. So there's work to be done there. But also, like, is Alec Pierce a sharp route runner? And Tess Walker faster. So, like, I, I I just think here at 82, you're not losing anything by adding him in as at least competition for Alec Pierce. And if anything, you're gaining a little bit more speed and I think potential to be a better route runner. Uh, you just got to rebuild his confidence. Like, drops to me, part of it's the player, but part of it's also confidence. So, I think building up his confidence and this could depend, potentially be an Alec Pierce upgrade. All right, let's get on to pick number 83, Los Angeles Rams. This is a guy where... It's kind of weird to say this considering Notre Dame's like track record of being a great place to develop offensive linemen, but Fisher was one of the like you know uh, exceptions to that rule. Like he didn't get better. He, he didn't really take that step forward that maybe we, he should have. Uh, but I think he could end up being a better pro because of that because the tools and traits are there, athleticism, size. So uh, I can see where this is kind of the the Rams drafting him sitting him behind Rob Havenstein for a year or two, and then eventually having him be that uh, future piece at right tackle. You know, we talk about that a lot with the Eagles, but the, the Rams are kind of in a similar spot. And here in the third round, I think it's a good time for them to target one of those tackle spots. All right, back to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And pick number 84, I'm going to go back to the offensive line well. And you, you know Pittsburgh. Look, there's only one one school where Kenny Pickett goes 20th overall to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and it's Pittsburgh. If, if he's the quarterback at Wisconsin, at UNLV, at USF, you, you, any school, any school, other than Pitt, Kenny Pickett's not the pick for the Steelers. Anyways, I'll get off my soapbox. But Matt Gunclavez, uh, kind of an interesting guy. Because this is the chance to kind of buy at the bottom of the market. This was supposed to be his kind of breakout chance. But he got hurt early in the year, so he never had the opportunity. But he's played both left and right tackle. So the reports are that Pittsburgh's comfortable running it back with Dan Moore Jr. and Broderick Jones, who... At, after the last game of the year for the Steelers, noted, yeah, left tackle's my more natural spot. That's where I'm more comfortable. So... Why make that change? Why let him play his natural position? No, let's just keep him at right tackle. You know, Pittsburgh for you. But maybe that's just smoke. But I can see a world where they're, they're content with that. And then they bring in Conclavez. And he's kind of just 
competition uh, for one of those two guys at left tackle, right tackle. In my perfect world, you move Brockett Jones over to left tackle where, like he said, it's his natural position, and you bring in uh, Goncalves as a uh, right tackle competition with Dan Moore. That would be my ideal world, and plus we know they like driving, drafting those Pitt Panthers, so maybe this is a guy that is on their radar. And again, chance to kind of buy at the bottom of the market could end up being a steal. All right, let's get on to the Houston Texans. Another upside play here. Mason Smith wasn't like awe-inspiring or like jaw-dropping this year, but you know, top top high school recruit for a reason. Insane athletic traits and definitely could be uh, a bolster to the middle of that defensive line there for Houston. And if there's anybody who can bring out the best of Mason Smith, I think D'Amico Ryans is a prime candidate to do that. And if you had the disruptor in the middle of that D-line, that defense goes to another level. Cleveland Browns at 86. I'm going to go Javon Foster, another guy that had a pretty solid week at the Senior Bowl. Uh, I've always kind of worried about what his athleticism would look like, but actually looked like he would hang, he hung pretty well against Senior Bowl competition. And a lot of those guys are going to play at the NFL level. So I feel pretty confident that he'll be able to stick at the next level. I think you draft Javon Foster and you make it a training camp battle between him and Jedrick Wills. Wills coming off the injury. He's on the fifth-year option. It's fully guaranteed, so you're already on the hook for that money. If Foster beats him out, you play him and you deal with it. If he doesn't, then you give Wills one more year and we'll see if we want to extend him next offseason. If not, you have Javon Foster in building ready to take that position over. So like that pick at 86, and that's going to kind of continue to be a trend for me. Third round, good place for the, uh, excuse me, the Browns, the future-proof off its tackle. Dallas Cowboys at 87. I'm going to go Jermaine Burton, kind of a potential long-term Brandon Cooks replacement. I do agree with some who have said like Burton has, he fell off towards the end of the year. Totally agree with that. It's got quieter when I kind of needed him to get more noise. Like I wanted him to kind of build his stock and ultimately kind of went away quietly, you know, especially once you get to the playoff. It's like, you know, where is he in this game? You know, so... That's tough, but I also think like if he at 87, I don't mind drafting a one-note receiver, and I think as a deep threat, Jermaine Burton can totally be that one-note, you know, receiver and a potential upgrade, not upgrade per se, but replacement to Brandon Cooks, who is making a lot of money, but also you know getting close to that point where it's like, mm, how much longer can that speed be in play? Right, you get that, you get to that age 30 window, and I, is Cook, Cooks is either right before 30 or he's at 30 now, uh, and that's kind of the age where it's like, mm, how much longer is he going to be able to have that speed in his back pocket? So. Don't mind drafting a year early, getting Jermaine Burton to be that long-term Brandon Cooks replacement. And maybe it'll be he may be a one-note receiver, but especially if it's a deep threat, I don't hate that value at 87. Green Bay Packers at pick number 88. We're going to go interior offensive line. Dominic Pooney, PFF has him as a uh, tackle, but I think he's going to play guard. And at the Senior Bowl, his best reps came at guard and center. So uh, this could one be a Josh Myers potential upgraded center. That pick hasn't worked out as well as they thought. But I think you just plug him in at right guard. Or you play him at left guard and you flip Elton Jenkins over to right guard. Ultimately, that's probably the easier move considering he played left tackle at Kansas. So, slide him at left guard, flip Jenkins over to play right guard. He's played right tackle. think he'd be fine making that flip. And all of a sudden, the Green Bay O-line is looking pretty decent. Tampa Bay's next up at 89. I'm going to go Jaden Hicks. I think this team could definitely use another safety. We'll see what happens with Antoine Winfield Jr., have a hard time thinking they're going to let him walk. So pairing Jaden Hicks up as this box safety primarily who can't play. Eh, I don't know. More of a snap actually came over the top, but we'll see what the athletic testing comes in at. The testing may make him a box safety, but he may have enough juice to play over the top. Either way you spin it, Winfield Jr. is a super versatile guy. So wherever Hicks plays, Winfield Jr. in the slot or in that other spot, love it a ton. They need another safety to uh, continue to rebuild that Bucks defense. Uh, getting back to where it was the year they won the Super Bowl, at least. Uh, Chargers, easy one here. This was one I knew I was going to go with before the mock even started. Blake Corum, Harbaugh gets his guy. You know, so and he gets him at 90, solid value. They're moving on from Austin Eckler, it sounds like. So Blake Corum is the bell cow back. Makes a lot of sense there in L.A. On to the other L.A. team, I'm going to have the Rams draft Cam Hart. Liked what I saw from him at the Senior Bowl. A lot of size, uh, kind of an underrated athlete too. And uh, actually, wh whoever Notre Dame played, they were more often than not avoiding Cam Hart, which I also think says a lot. So I think this team can definitely use an upgrade at the outside corner spot. They could definitely use some size, assuming they don't bring back Akella Witherspoon. And at 6'3", Hart gives you that size. Lions at 92. I'm going to go Christian Mahogany. So I'm double dipping an offensive line here. Uh, and Mahogany has only played guard, but I do think center flexibility here. Like I see a lot of Zion Johnson where it's like any of those three interior spots, Mahogany could definitely plug in and play. So I think BB is your right guard of the future. Mahogany comes in as your right guard of the future. You re-sign Frank Ragnow and uh, trying to keep it cheap where we can. Uh, and I think you get two, and another guy just like BB, just like a mean dude. Like Mahogany definitely to me feels like a Detroit Lions. So I love that pick a ton. And depending on what happens with Ragnow, you do have Mahogany. You could fall back on him as a potential center option moving forward. Ravens then at 93. Let's give him Chris Abrams' drain. Um, Kyle Hamilton primarily plays in the slot, but I love the flexibility you get with Abrams' drain here where he primarily played on the outside. His body type makes you think more slot so that's where i'd lean but if you're gonna play kyle hamilton there you could also fold abram strain as an outside corner where i think they could use one more guy brandon stevens 
pretty decent player, Marlon Humphrey, but he's kind of getting to that age, and somebody called me out last episode and said he was 30. That's my fault. Uh, he's, he's a couple years away from that, but 27, 28, you start thinking about it, a receiver in a corner, unless you're like, you know, Jalen Ramsey. But even Jalen Ramsey, like, once he got closer to 30, it became a conversation, and eventually the Rams traded him, right? So you get to that point where, like, late 20s into the 30s, it's a conversation, and I think that's kind of where we're starting to get at with Marlon Humphrey. And plus, he's been up and down the last two years. So, anyways, moving on. One more guy who can play inside and out. I love that addition. And I think 93 is a great value for a guy who has a ton of experience, both playing in the slot and on the outside in the SEC. To me, absolute great value. San Francisco's next up at 94. And kind of a similar thing, but different. Uh, Kalen King only has one good year of college football play, and it was a year ago. But it was an elite season. And yeah, this year he was beaten up, and yeah, he's a little small, and the senior bowl was brutal. To me, it's a confidence thing. And I am totally thinking slot only. I, I have been saying that this whole time. I think Kalen Clint King is going to be a slot corner at the next level. Uh, and I think that you know playing him on the outside was kind of leaving the door open for him to get pushed around and beaten up by someone like a Marvin Harrison Jr. who's six foot four and 200-plus pounds. So, you know, I, I just play him on the inside, and I think the 49ers might be needing that guy. Like, they might be playing... Uh, Hafunga at free safety. Majority of his snaps before the, the injury he had were at free safety. And then Jair Brown is probably your Tashawn Gibson replacement at box safety. Can play a little bit of slot. I actually thought he would be a Jimmy Ward replacement. But let's just say he's a Tashawn Gibson box safety replacement. You draft Kalen King to play the slot. May not be the world's greatest tackler, so that's a little bit of a TBD. Um, but just the movement skills and then kind of rebuilding his confidence and taking away the easy stuff over the middle of the field. I'd still draft Kalen King here in the third round. Not like pick 65 or anything like that, but you get in the late 80s, the 90s, I still think the talent's there. And it's kind of like what I said about Derek Stingley a few years ago. If you show me a year of elite play, you show me that it's capable, that you're capable of doing it. So I would just kind of invest in Kalen King later on, try to build up that confidence and see if we can get it back there. Specifically, if you, you're you comfortable with him being a slot corner. So Pittsburgh, hopefully, you know, maybe kind of sneaks back up into this range or trades down into this range and they give him a shot. I'd love that fit. But here, San Francisco think they can use an upgrade over Isaiah Oliver in the slot. I think Kalen King, if they rebuild that confidence, could be the dude. Anyways, let's move on to Kansas City now at 95. I'm going to go Ruka Roro. Ro. Charles Amani, he signed a one-year deal, or excuse me, a two-year deal, and now he's in that last year of that contract, so it's not like an insane amount of money, so they probably just keep him around. But moving forward a year, I think we basically just draft a, a year ahead, and Ruka Roro becomes our Charles Amani replacement. Love his flexibility across the defensive line, can fold inside, can start outside on early downs. Love what a Roro brings to the table, and again, Feels like a logical um, Amenity Hugh replacement. We're just doing it a year in advance. Jacksonville Jaguars at 96. I'm actually going to have them uh, also go to the cornerback position going Jerrion Jones. Um, love his uh, athleticism and how his tape maybe projects to playing slot corner. And again, I think this is a great class for slot corners. I do think Jaron Jones, with his movement skills, is going to play on the inside. I think that's the position the Jags are missing. That's why like, if they go to Cooper DeGene at 17, I'm all for it. I love the idea of them taking Brian Branch last year. Didn't end up happening. Um, Darius Williams is a better outside corner. I think Tyson Campbell can get back on track. Also an outside corner. Jaron Jones, slot him in at inside. Also think he's a willing tackler, has a body type, can be a hard enough hitter too. Um, so I, I think playing him on the inside kind of rounds out that secondary and gets us to where we need to be for that Ryan Nielsen defense. Philadelphia at 97. I'm actually going to have them trade. It's just, you know, not the, not the most important pick in the world. Um, but there was one more thing I wanted to be able to put on the Chicago Bears roster. There they are. Pick 111, so it's going to be 111, 497, and then Philadelphia's also going to get pick 143. So, like, not the world's craziest trade. It's been accepted. But this is a team that needs an over-the-top free safety after moving on from Eddie Jackson. And Kalen Bullock is a terrible tackler, and I don't want him in the box whatsoever. But if there's a way you can keep him clean and keep him as a true free safety center field ball hawking type, he could maybe, just maybe, <laughs> kind of emulate Eddie Jackson and the, the playmaking ability he had, I guess, what, four, five, six years ago. It's a little bit of a projection. It's going to take some time because Bullock still just got to get better as a tackler. But this is the range where I feel comfortable drafting Kalen Bullock. I, I won't do it because he's he's not there. Like a forced missed tackle percentage or a missed tackle percentage, I think north of 15%. I guess we could find out just by clicking on this. Uh, missed tackle rate, 13.5%. So that's bad. <laughs> and a run defense grade of, what, 43 and a half, 49? Yeah, brutal. But if you can coach him up there, the playmaking ability is absolutely there. And I think here at 97, this is where I feel comfortable taking that shot on uh, Bullock. Pick number 98, uh, if this team misses out on Brandon Ayuk or Jawan Jennings, Jamari Thrash absolutely makes a ton of sense. Long speed for days, but also a great yards after the catch weapon. Specifically, they miss out on uh, 
Juwan Jennings. He's not a great blocker, which that's I feel like that's actually probably what they'll miss most out of Juwan Jennings when he gets signed somewhere else. I do think he's going to leave. But with the salary cap being pumped up, I think they're going to keep Brandon Ayuk around. So Thrash is that receiver three. I still think it makes it work. You just got to figure out who's going to be that blocking guy. Uh, but who knows? Maybe they bring back both guys and I go elsewhere with this pick. Maybe back to the interior offensive line well. Buffalo Bills at 99. As we're running out of picks to talk about, I'm going to go to the safety group. We have ignored that spot so far. Sione Vaki, only two years of college experience because he was on a Mormon mission, so that sucked. But 2022, 2022, he's a really good player. 2023, maybe a little bit more up and down at the safety spot. But I believe in the potential. I think he's a great downhill safety, but also with athleticism to where he can play in those split safety looks and be fine over the top. Also... At the Senior Bowl, we got to see him play some running back, which excites me a ton. So could he kind of add himself into that rotation? Maybe, maybe not. Like, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it'd be kind of a cool wrinkle to throw in there. But I definitely believe he could be one of those split safety guys moving forward. And also, like, there's a world where, you know, only two years of college experience. Maybe you bring back Poyer and Hyde for one more season, running back one more time. And then that kind of gives Vaki the time to kind of build up and learning from two of the best safeties of my generation. So uh, great place for him to learn, grow, and get better. Two more picks to talk about. Green Bay Packers. I'm going to give them Audric Estime. I am a Notre Dame fan, so maybe this is biased, but Estime, maybe it takes him a second to get to that top speed, but dude, once he's there, dude's a bulldozer. He's an absolute bowling ball. Ton of strength, ton of physicality, and again, once he hits that top speed, he can get going. So I don't think the 10-yard split's going to be special, but he might end up running a decent 40 once he hits that top end speed, depending on how long it takes. But love Estime as that A.J. Dillon replacement. I actually think he might be a little bit more explosive than an A.J. Dillon brings to the table, which, you know, Dillon's kind of been there like three, four yards and a pound of dust. Like, I think Estime gives you a little bit more explosiveness than Dillon does. Last pick, I also want to add a caveat here. So I was thinking about going Cade Stover here, giving this team another tight end option because, um, you know, Logan Thomas can't play forever. This team has pick 103, as you'll see here. Uh, So I'll go Cade Stover at pick 103 that we're not going to do. And because this team could potentially lose out on Curtis Samuel and free agency, let's go get them another yards after the catch. Uh guy in Malachi Corley who also brings an abundance of speed and explosiveness in his own right. So Malachi Corley is that Curtis Samuel replacement and then two picks later, Washington should draft uh, Cade Stover. Love that, uh, you know, two picks and then what, a four pick span there for Washington would love if that could actually end up playing out. But guys, that's going to do it for my first three round mock draft of this draft cycle. Sorry for the longer video. I'm going to try to be a little bit more succinct with my thoughts in future mocks. I'm going to try to keep these videos at right at an hour. So apologies. I'm a little more long winded here. The first three rounders always a little bit of a tough one. So uh, apologies for how long this video is, but hopefully you guys still enjoyed. Hit that like button if you did. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. I want to see more mock drafts, more draft content. Got to get my position rankings updated as well. So that should be coming here in the near future as well. But most importantly, let me know what you guys think down below in the comment section. Who went too high? Who went too low? And who's your favorite team? And what'd you think of the haul I gave your squad? We're now, you know, I love doing three-round mocks because these are the picks you got to hit. Top 100, you've got to nail it. And now we're basically doing videos where we're talking about these picks that these teams need to nail. So let me know down below. Did I nail it for your squad? Did I not? What'd you think of the trades? What would you do differently? Like, if you don't like the pick, don't just come in swinging. Don't just call me a dumbass. Like, yes, that's true. But let me know what you would change and uh, maybe why you don't like the picks and what position group you're targeting, what guys you like for your team, all that sort of fun stuff. Love to hear your thoughts. I'm going to try to respond to every comment that I can. So I want to say thank you everyone for watching this three round mock draft. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is T and I am signing off.